how large is the restoration center, square footage for how large of a population, and is the cost savings um, related to economy of scale, so is it, uh, is it yeah, comparable? So the restoration center um, probably is probably twice the size of this room. It, has, uh, it, it is not very big, but it's very efficient. It has uh, a sobering section. It has a detox section, medical clearance section, psychiatric screening section, and substance abuse uh, screening section. Now, uh, the building literally is, is, about, is about twice uh, this site. And the second question, um, remember, we're a city of about two million, and that is the, the central uh, psychiatric homeless treatment facility uh, that we have. So we are finding out that we are going to have to expand because just the city is, just for emergency services, psychiatric services uh, at all. But what, what I found now that it's a lot easier because county and city already understand, they get it. And they also get those metrics every month. For example, we see 2,100 people every single month. And of those, law enforcement brings in about 140 to 160 a month. And on the sobering side, there's a whole series of reports. So the metrics are provided every single month to show a return in, of investment right at around four to one. And so we have nothing but support. It's taken us a long time uh, to get there. I was just with the, the, the county judge uh, yesterday and we pitched a $35 million a year for five year program. And he said, hey, it looks good, let's do it. Let's go for it. Of course, what he liked the fact was it was the hospitals that were going to pay for it more so. I hope that answered your question. How was the message of this model delivered to the public? You know, originally, that's a great question because originally we did have the NIMBY, not in my backyard. And it was, oh, you know, there's going to be crime and all this stuff going on. And, and so we, we, we literally started to have community uh, for, forums and people were asking and then we literally would say look if we don't do anything is it going to get better and interestingly enough it was the faith-based community that really came in and said you know you got to take care of your brother you got to take care of your sister and we began to we began we made promises I mean I literally said okay you want us to build a fence we'll build a fence Okay, give us six months, and we give six months. Now remember, we're working with law enforcement. So law enforcement is there the whole time. It's safe. There were no incidents, and we started to build credibility. Um, it, and, and as we built credibility, people started to understand. You saw the outcomes. People were getting better. We had an individual, 46 years old, downtown San Antonio, arrested multiple times. Our park police knew the guy. Here he comes again. Here we go again. So they bring him in. We take him to sobering. He sobers up, but he needs detox. We take him to detox. He goes through detox. In detox, he clears up. He's floridly psychotic. We walk him across the hallway he starts to get treatment for his psychosis. He clears up. 10 years prior to his being on the street, his wife suddenly and tragically died of natural causes. And he could not deal with it and literally broke and had been on the street the whole time. And he was one of our university professors. Tell me it's not worth doing this. Is uh, uh, CIT training uh, required for uh, Rapid City Police and Sheriff and uh, Pennington County Sheriff? Is it required training? It is yes. for the for the police. Yes, Sheriff also. Yes. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Um, 
most, and so since most of our um, law enforcement are trained uh, in CIT, uh, but we don't have a restoration center, how do you see the Haven uh, model working without the restoration center or until one is built? <coughs> we, had, we had to deal with that, uh, that, that same issue. And so the question is diversion. So the question is, everybody understands, they get it, you know, we're going to divert this person from the jail, we're going to divert them from the uh, squad car, we're going to divert them from the hospital. The real question is, where do you divert to? That's the question. And so what we had to do was to develop an array very quickly of, of um, crisis services that were tied to intensive outpatient services that were tied to transitional services that were tied to standard outpatient services. And those were not in place initially. So what we had to do is the old school social work way, on the phone with Catholic charities or Baptist ministries or uh, the network of providers, the local mental health authority, and can you do this and you do this? So there was a lot of calling and a lot of uh, connecting. Now we have a much more centralized system. We have a resource directory. We have entire uh, uh, committees that are, that are responsible for homeless, connection, transitional services, uh, substance abuse services, mental health services. So that array is much more involved. So you have to just kind of connect, connect, connect. If you're so concerned about our health, why do you have such good treats on the middle of these tables? <laughs> <laughs> okay, that wasn't a question. Um, good one, good one. What can judges do to facilitate uh, this program? Well, you know, one of the, uh, one of the concerns that, that our judges always have is they really are on the hook. You know, they're... They've got to look at that person. And for us, you know, we can say, you know, judge, we think you ought to let him go. He's a nice guy. But when that judge signs the order, guess who's on the hook? A judge. So I've never run into any judge that says, if you tell me that you're going to take him into treatment and you're going to update me and you're going to tell me somebody's going to watch him, and you're going to report if he doesn't get treatment, and you're going to bring him back, I've never had one say no. So their role is absolutely critical. We call it the black robe effect. And so here's an instance of how we use the black robe effect, not in the criminal justice area, but in the probate area. So our police chief, back in the day, our police chief got a phone call every single day from this woman who has somehow got his cell phone. On Christmas, she called him twice. And he was very concerned for her. And he would send the officers out, and the officers would go out, and he goes, you know, Chief, you know, she's got the tinfoil on her head, you know, tinfoil on the windows. Uh, it, it's real hard to hear her because she won't open the door. And so, but she wasn't breaking the law, she had her own home, and it was real clear this was not. So it kept calling and calling and calling, and there was a real concern for her health and, and welfare. So we got a call, <clears throat> and I said, well, you know, Judge Oscar Kazin over here is a probate court judge. And I bet you if we go talk to Judge Kazin, he's gonna allow us to issue an order for protective custody to check her health and welfare, so we did. And then we began a program which is not, we, we, we had a terrible name for it, and we called it the Involuntary Outpatient Commitment Program. We, we did, we, we were dumb, we messed up, I knew that. Now it's called nationally Assisted Outpatient Treatment. Much better, much better. So Assisted Outpatient Treatment says the judge can order you into treatment. And if you don't comply with that treatment, he can order you into the state hospital. It almost rarely never happens. But our outcomes were phenomenal. I mean, we had folks go down to almost zero rehospitalizations. Why? Because it, 
Every week they had a case manager check them, they got their medications, and every month they'd show up in front of this guy wearing a black robe, authoritarian figure saying, Mary, you're doing great. So glad to see you doing much better. Keep going, keep going. And she kept going. By the way, just to add uh, that uh, regarding the question regarding the Restoration Center and this working without the Restoration Center, much of what the Restoration Center is all about is what is uh, Pennington County is uh, going to be doing with remodeling the uh, NAU building. Um, so given the economic success of the program, what, uh, ex why is there not a massive groundswell nationally to initiate similar programs? There is, uh, really, there is, uh, and I'll give you two, uh, I'll give you three, four, three examples. <clears throat> so I happen to be on the, uh, Nas the National Association of Counties board, uh, and they're the uh, counties, not all of the counties, but most of the counties, it's about 4,000 counties that are part of this NACO, and NACO has a just <coughs> justice committee and the Justice Committee informs Congress uh, on behalf of the counties what they think are the best uh, things, uh, things to do. And so one of the initiatives that we have, that we have fostered is a, second, is, is a second initiative that I want to talk about. It's, also, it's called the Stepping Up Initiative. And the Stepping Up Initiative is a, a series of about 1,500 counties across the nation that are saying jail diversion works, this is how you do it, uh, addressing the needs of, 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 the, of the most vulnerable population, your homeless population, your folks that are misdemeanor nonviolent offenders, your folks that, that have an addiction, that is what's going to be the most helpful. And if you just, if you just Google, use the Google, and in the Google machine you can put in uh, uh, first uh, diversion stepping up initiative, uh, Patrick Kennedy is, is very big. Also, now I, I don't know what's going to happen now because of the change in the in the administration, but the Obama White House up until December, I was up there in November, December, uh, they had a data-driven justice initiative that's addressing these issues and try and fostering and trying to help counties uh, and and cities work on these type of efforts. Cue to the wise. This year is going to be a very, very big year for mental health because, like it or not, it's a major issue. But it is an issue, oddly enough, that both the right and the left are coming to bless you and those that are with you. <laughs> it's a major issue for the right and the left. That's as good as it gets, folks. The right and the left. On the right, your fiscal conservatives says, why should I do this? Because it saves you money and reduces your budget. I mean, it, it's, not a, it's, a, it's a cost difference. You can spend it now or spend it later. But if you divert an individual, it's like that figure that you saw. If an officer, just one police officer, if that officer has the ability to divert one person, if he knows that he can take them somewhere where they're going to be OK, they're going to get help, they're going to get treatment, that officer, those costs, again for Bear County, is going to be $350 for that one arrest event. But if that officer has to take that person to jail, again in Bear County, that cost for that same situation is $2,295. So do you want to spend $2,295 or $350? So it, it is very costly. So stepping up initiative, White House Data Initiative, which is still in place, although it's in, in transition, um, and then uh, NACO, the NACO initiatives. In Rapid City, currently, uh, we do have uh, CIT training. There is a youth uh, emergency shelter program. There's also an adult crisis care center. How do we get the community to fund local support of treatment services? You know, that <coughs> that's an item that is near and dear to my heart because that is the one thing that I've seen 
that if you have treatment, and here's the missing piece, and those old school social workers in here know this already, but it's good old fashioned relationship. It's good old fashioned tracking and monitoring and being there. There's no magic, you just, it's gut work, relationship kind of thing. If you, if, if you do that, then that, that, that is, that is going to help. So, the way we've been able to get funds for treatment is to be able to show the outcomes. And we've had some pretty, pretty big successes because we've been able to say, this 500, you gave us these dollars to address these 500. These 500 have not been, their arrest rate is, I think our average right now is like 6, 10% and the national rate is about 32%. So we're showing that. But more importantly, that the individual is staying engaged in treatment. And so it's, again, it's the data. You have to show the data. And we've had instances where we thought we were doing something really good, and it was an unmitigated disaster, <laughs> like the time <clears throat> some dummy got into his idea, into, into thinking that, we, it, well, if we could just get an officer to fill in this form, we could get all these other metrics. And we were watching our numbers, and the day we implemented that form, our, our attendance, our, our participation went <laughs> It was really clear. Tore the form off, and our attendance by police officers went <laughs> One little form. But what I'm getting at is the ability to calibrate and turn on a dime in terms of whether it's successful or, or profitable or not. So you, for, for our, in our world, we want to know two things. But our mayor wants to know two things. Is the person getting help? And what is the risk to public safety? Because public safety is always first. You have to have public safety. But then there's the, the clinical acuity level so that you can handle, but it's always relative to the risk. So when we work with someone, we always assess risk and clinical acuity and base our treatment there. If, the, if there's a high risk, then judges are involved or law enforcement is involved, and, and we always get a judge's uh, opinion. So that's how we would address that. Regarding the location of the uh, Haven for Hope campus, was that vetted with the community uh, before any con uh, locations were considered? Absolutely not. So here's what happened. <clears throat> so we were tootling around. We, meaning uh, this, we were the local mental health authority. And so my job was to bring the community together and meet with them and, and just go through that, that, that whole process. And we were looking at, at the different options. And it just happened that we, the Center for Healthcare Services, a local treatment, mental health treatment facility, happened to own an old dialysis building. And we owned it free and clear. We had bought it a while ago for whatever reason. And then right on the other side of the dialysis building was literally a dump. It was dilapidated buildings. It was a mess. It was terrible. Uh, and it was a drug infest. You did not want to go there. And so when Mr. Greehy came by, and we started looking at that, and, and he was talking about developing the homeless campus, and we were saying, you, gotta make, you better make sure you have substance abuse and mental health services available there. He said, well, if we buy this, and the area just happened to be downtown, and nobody wanted it. So we bought it. And then the communities, oh, wait a minute, not, not in our backyard, and so forth. So again, the process, several, several meetings. But you know, even the community understands that what, if you're, what you're trying to do is for the good of the community. Once we went through the vetting process and, the, and meeting with the community, we literally did not have any, any major issues then. How do you find? Wow, y'all are good. Yeah. How do you fund uh, your ongoing costs? Um, there are 125 ways. Literally, the local mental health, in Texas, uh, every county has an associated local mental health authority. 
And that authority, that authority receives its dollars from the state, from the feds, and from the local <laughs> city and county gov governments. So it just happens that because Bear County is so large, uh, we, we happen to have one mental health authority for that county, that's, that's Leon Evans. So that authority automatically gets every year about $40 million. The additional, the, the current operating budget for the local mental health authority is $100 million. And where the rest of that money came from is state, county, city, grants, and a little thing called the 1115 waivers. Are you all familiar with that? 1115 waivers is because Texas, well now, again, we're in a whole new ballpark now, so this doesn't apply anymore, but we were a non-ACA state. In other words, we did not take Affordable Care Act dollars. But our politicians, they're pretty smart guys, they went up, gals went up there, and they said, but we want these uh, certain initiatives, we want to develop these initiatives and we want Medicaid dollars, but we don't want to call it Affordable Care Act. So we call it 1115 waiver dollars. So the funding literally comes through that, and that's going to end uh, this year. For Texas, uh, if we go to uh, block grants, I, I think we're going to be OK, because we're kind of in that mode. But for other states, um, I don't know how they're, they're going to do it, especially the ACA state. So we're in a different world now. There are a couple of questions regarding CIT training. Um, one had to do with how, to, how does one distinguish uh, when, when it's mental illness? And then also, what about those who are actually uh, have dementia, but they're exhibiting these? So comment on about those mental up approaches. I can tell you that. The success that we have had in Bear County with reference to our diversion efforts and Haven for Hope were crucially kicked off and founded by law enforcement because it was our willingness to resolve the operational obstacles for law enforcement with respect to mental illness and substance abuse and developmental disabilities because that's a whole new bag. So when we develop the 40-hour curriculum, and our officers go through the cadet training, which has 40-hour CIT, and then they go at the end of their second year, when they, have the, the, when they complete their second year in, on the field, on the street, they go back again and they get another 40-hour CIT training. And so obviously we spend a lot of time in the curriculum because Firefighters, law enforcement officers, they get it all. They see it all. Yes? You guys see it all every day. If you're, you're in trouble and you need help, you're not going to call a psychologist. <laughs> you're going to call a police officer. You're going to call the sheriff's deputy. That's just, that's just the way it is. The, the, the magic that w for us was not only did we develop a, a we, we couldn't go back if we wanted to. But what we really got smart on is we brought in our firefighters. And I tell you, the first time that we did that, and we literally had an officer come up and say, you know, we show up at the scene and these doggone firefighters, they're trying to talk to this person, and I mean, they don't have no idea. And the firefighter would say, you guys come in there with your big macho thing. And, and so they were kind of fighting, but after a while they started realizing and it was literally magic to see the two cultures come, come together. Now in San Antonio and Bear County, we don't do anything without fire, EMS and law enforcement. They are part of every single initiative. For example, to the degree that, this is, this is great stuff, you're not gonna believe this, truly, truly. As a matter of fact, the White House is gonna publish, or already published it in, in their toolkit. So, uh, we're in a meeting, and we typically have meetings at, at PD headquarters. And one of the police chiefs says, look, a couple of our officers, we want to do more. 
we want to know, we, we want to just give us four questions to ask so that we can uh, get a little better at identifying, yeah, we've gone through CIT training, but I want four questions that can be, uh, that can be uh, documented. So we started developing these four questions, and I called Fred Osher in Washington and vetted that, and vetted it with our psychiatrists and so forth. So then we handed it to law enforcement. So now a law enforcement officer can pick somebody up and they can go to restoration and that's it, that's great. But if for whatever reason they can't and the officer feels like they need to take them to magistration, which is the entryway to, law, to, to the jail, four questions are asked. And when we first asked these questions, you'd have thought we, man, it was bad. Here are the four questions. And it was because of the language of the four questions. Officers didn't have any problems with it, but the public did. Number one, have you ever been seen by a psychologist or a mental health worker? Have you ever been on medications or been prescribed medications for a mental illness? Those were okay, nobody had problems with that one. Here's the problem. Have you ever thought of killing yourself? Are you now currently wanting to kill yourself? Those were the two. But we were looking at it from the perspective of we needed to know to be able to help that person immediately. So if the questions were answered yes, they, got, they stepped up the line and they got a clinician right away, right then and there. Remember, we went from 100% no screening to 100% screening. And that made it, to this day, when something happens, the first thing they ask me is, what did he say, what did he say? Did, did he answer the questions? And sure enough, if there was a suicide attempt, there's, yep. Have you ever thought of suicide? Yes. Are you going to feel like hurting yourself? Yes. Hello? Have you um, all tracked the relationship of your services <coughs> to reducing or preventing child abuse and to reuniting families? Well, that's a question and it's a good idea. No, we haven't. But that's, uh, that's you know, we, we need to. Uh, kids get hurt because their parents need help or something's wrong and we haven't identified them. Uh, I, I did fail to mention though, we actually do have a crisis care center for children and adolescents. 24 hours, seven days a week. It gets nowhere near the press that Haven does. But, but it is there. But I tell you with children, You've got to support the parents. You've got to be there for the parents. That, so the answer, I'm sorry, no, we don't. Need to, but we don't. So this uh, question is starting with the headline of data-driven solutions. Mm -hmm. And then the question is, I think I, I get the question, if South Dakota is not taking care of these people now, how do you reduce spending of nearly nothing? <laughs> That's good news. If you've got nothing, the only thing that can happen is go up. And, but that's precisely, the, that's precisely the, that's the situation that we found ourselves in 2002. We were going to lose the jail. We were going to get sanctioned. Uh, the mental health authority was bankrupt. We had no money. There was, you couldn't go any more negative than that. I guess you could, you know. Oh. But what, what happened is literally the police chief stepped up, the sheriff stepped up, the local provider stepped up, the community stepped up and said, you know, I, I, got, I, can, I can do donuts, you know. That was not a joke. I can do, <laughs> I can do donuts or I can do a, a lunch or I can do this or we can provide them in. And so it's literally the community, community saying, okay, maybe we can't do it that way, but if we try this way or that way, Maybe someone here, <clears throat> I was literally doing a presentation one day, literally, two story in Austin. Finished the presentation and this lady comes up to me and she says, I believe in what you're doing. We'd like to give you $40,000. <laughs> Works for me. <laughs> and there's more. So that person calls Leon and says, uh, we'd like to meet with you. We've done a jail diversion presentation. So she comes over with her bosses 
and we finish that little table discussion, and they're looking at all the things that we did, and $4.2 million later, we had completed the, the next phase of our diversion initiatives, and that company's name was AstraZeneca. Boy, that's a great question. Yeah, these are good questions. Um, Super duper. Are there other homeless shelters still operating in uh, San Antonio, and what is their relationship to Haven for Hope like, if, they're, if so? Uh, that I'm aware of, there are not, but there are, there are areas of uh, sanctuary. You know, we're, we're sanctuary city, uh, and uh, churches are still very much involved. But the quality and the caliber and the completeness and the thoroughness of the services that one gets at Haven, because uh, all you do is show up and show commitment. If you're a young woman with kids, you just show up. If you're ready to put your life together and move forward, you just show up. And it, it doesn't get any better. So yes, there are, but nowhere near the, the extent and the breadth and the depth. And remember, Haven for Hope, I didn't just do it. This is the community. This is many people that came together. And in their own way, they, they, they came together to contribute and leverage. Our last question before we wrap up. And, and it's a good one. It's amazing. They're still yeah. awake. This is one of the best ones. Can you discuss the role of faith-based spiritual leaders and religion, what role it plays in the success of Haven for Hope? Um, yeah, that's it. And, and also, it also says leadership at the end, not only what the faith-based uh, um, groups play, but what about the leaders themselves? So let's talk about the leadership first. So... So I'm in jail, and Leon Emmons calls me, and he says, why don't you come down? I already mentioned, come down, and I said no, and he said yes. Yeah. So, so he says, let's do jail diversion. Let's put together, let's, let's address this criminalization of mental illness. So, so long, and the straight, long and the short of it is that for the last 16 years, I have not done anything but jail diversion. And in 2014, county commissioners said, we want you to do it in a much broader scope. And so I became the co coordinator, the Switzerland, the convener. I was the Barry Tice. Uh, because, by the way, you know, he knows how to use that telephone. <laughs> or either that or he's got me on speed dial, one of the two. But it was, it, it, it was one person that was the convener. And constant, so, so Krista Santa Rosa knew to call me uh, the University Hospital, the local mental health authority, the freestandings, and they knew we would meet every month. And not everybody shows up every month, but there was always one person. But what really kicked this off was you got to have the leadership. You got to have, we had a mayor that not only said yes, he said, hell yes, and a county judge. Tell me where you want me to be, when you want me to be, and what you want me to say. And they were there every step of the way for us. And who do you need to come to this meeting? So we would have these, these meetings, and Gilbert wouldn't convene the meeting. It was Judge Polly Jackson Spencer, our Mayor Wolf, our county judge. So the leadership have the ability to bring folks together. But you always had one coordinator that acted as Switzerland. No authority, but always, always a convener, always, always, always. So the second part of that question is my personal favorite because I'm the old, old school. If there is no vision, the people will perish. And one of the things, I'll give you an example of how faith-based is involved now. Uh, we have started to have, like California, we, we borrowed this idea from California. We had Pathways to, pathway, pathways to Hope. And they started in California, um, I forget their name, Saddleback Church. And so we began to have Pathways to Hope, and it's mental health, behavioral health, homeless uh, gathering. And it's a big to-do. We had 
Last year we had over 1,100 people uh, come, and we had all of the, you know, the providers and <coughs> and stuff, and it was great. So, faith-based the faith-based community now is working on initiatives where there are certain instances where maybe one church wants to sponsor a home, and another church sponsors another home where individuals are ready to follow sort of like the Fairweather Lodge model. If you're familiar with Fairweather Lodge model, it's, it's, it's self-governing groups of four or five. So it's an incredible, it's an incredible, very cost-effective mo model. It's a normalization model, and it's very effective. But faith-based community has been involved every step of the way, and has been very, very productive. And I look forward to it having an even greater role Wonderful. <coughs> let's uh, let's show Gilbert our appreciation. Oh, thank you.